And we're back for one more episode with Dr. Jennifer Noonan. Great to have you back. Great to be here. Thank you. So that's great, the different ways you're able to work this in with your teaching, and I know you've also done some, some writing. Didn't uh, your husband, Ben, and you can collaborate on a journal article, I think, was it with Paul Overland? Right, yes. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had kind of tested his textbook with him for him, and so we were collaborated first at a, an SBL panel right. talking about that, and then that was developed into an article on and um, teaching communicatively. Right. Mm -hmm. and I know you all collaborated uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Dallaire to uh, edit this book for uh, your professor, that, who's mm -hmm. your supervisor, right? That's Stephen correct. Kaufman. That's yes. Correct. And you've got a chapter on here that draws from your, mm -hmm. uh, your research. Right. And then you did yes. this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Please tell us more about this book and how, how this, and, and I noticed this isn't just Hebrew. This is for biblical studies. That's right. That's right. So in thinking about how do we get this out and how do we really get buy-in um, for people who are a bit skeptical, how do we train people to use these more communicative approaches, how do we, you know, and, and the long-term goal is, you know, I'd like to write a textbook, but I don't want to have to write a whole teacher's manual to go with it. Right. <laughs> so this is the teacher's manual. Um, but also just to inform the the community to kind of bridge these two disciplines yes. where you know we've got second language people doing spanish and french and we've got biblical studies people who don't know what the research is over here and so trying to inform the people teaching the ancient languages what's going on in second language acquisition and so i just kind of distilled what i see as some of the most important principles that SLA is, is teaching us right now, right. what we can learn from SLA, it briefly explain that principle, and then explain how, why we want to use it for the biblical languages, mm -hmm. and with a few examples of how you might use it. So at the end of each chapter, there's an example for Hebrew, there's an example for Greek, there's an example for Latin, of how you might take that principle and apply it to one of those languages. Excellent. And uh, you can get this from Glossa House. It's a wonderful uh, read. Um, you've got it laid out very well and very practical. But uh, I was, I was going to ask you, uh, how, what is your go-to uh, answer for people that they look at this at first? They hear second language acquisition. They say ancient texts. They say, great, German, French, Spanish. Those are modern languages. People use those. People speak mm -hmm. them. They communicate with them. But what, what do you say when they say, this is dead? We don't communicate with this text anymore. But we do. Reading is an act of communication. And absolutely, the principles are the same. And just because we're primarily reading doesn't mean we don't need to hear it because reading is subvocalization, where even if you're not audibly reading out loud, your brain is still hearing the language. And so you need to get that auditory input to help you read. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. And so, yes, it, it is communication. Yes, the auditory component it is necessary. There's so much of it that it's not its own thing. It is more analogous to Spanish and French, even though we're only reading. So, yes, we may not find ourselves in a conversation with someone in person in Biblical Hebrew, but we're having a conversation with the text, and that's part of what exegesis is, is trying right. to understand what that person is telling us. Historically and classically, too, texts were often read, I mean, the default was to read them aloud, right? right? Whether right. you're in a small group, maybe even by yourself, or yes. maybe you don't... In some cultures, maybe you didn't actually have your own copy, but you were accessing it by someone else reading. So, mm -hmm. right, silent reading is a modern innovation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. So uh, it's a good excuse to get in and enjoy the wordplay and <laughs> right, <laughs> these things right. you can pick up on too. Excellent. Right. So your book deals with um, not only uh, Hebrew but also with Greek mm -hmm. and with Latin, and mm -hmm. uh, got chapters on uh, brief history of modern linguistics and language teaching. Uh, different uh, building blocks, uh, implicit knowledge, explicit knowledge, automaticity. Now, that 
that implicit knowledge, that's, is that what you gain when you are doing more of the immersion and um, second language right. uh, informed approaches? Right, right. right. That's more of what right. we would call acquisition mm -hmm. if we were to contrast that with language, learning about a language. The explicit is more learning about a language. Where we learn the grammar rules and right. those things. Right. right. Okay. Right. And that's more of a deductive sort of, you, you learn this is how it works and then let's go to yes. specific examples. Right, right. Right. But, uh, and you're not against explicit knowledge, no. but no. just the order of, the natural order of getting into the language. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And explicit knowledge really informs us more for accuracy, whereas the implicit knowledge brings in the automaticity and fluency and the, the, mm, the feel for the language. You just know that you know. You don't know how you know. <laughs> you don't know how right. it got in there, but it's there and you can use it. Right. The child picks up long before they learn the actual grammar rules. They they learn pretty early. I don't. He didn't go to the store. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And when we use the language enough, excellent. So much in here on uh, different types of input and uh, mm -hmm. total physical response. Mm -hmm. um, does that include acting things out? Uh, oh, as part of uh, the pedagogy. Absolutely. Yes. And the yeah. the whole value of of total physical response or TPR is that you're giving them input. But because it's, especially early on, they don't have enough that they can talk back to you. Right. So they respond with action. So you tell them, go to the door, sit down, stand up. And they do it demonstrating that they've comprehended it. And so that allows you to provide them with a rich, comprehensible input. And they're not just passively going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. <laughs> but they're demonstrating that they know it, they understand it, and that they're doing something with it. Right. Now, when we talk about integrating these different aspects of second language acquisition, is there anything that is part and parcel of the traditional grammar translation type approach that, that you would say, now, even though we're doing this, we still want to keep these sorts mm -hmm. of activities in our pedagogy, right. even from the beginning? Right. I would say vocabulary. The way we do vocabulary in the traditional approach, I think, would match very well with what the second language acquisition experts would say. So, in terms of uh, vocabulary, first of all, is more explicit knowledge. You're making a direct, oh, I know that's a house, and I know the word for house is this. That is more explicit knowledge. Um, vocabulary by nature is just more explicit. And so the intentional memorization, that, that goes a long way. I wouldn't stop there, but certainly flashcards, you know, they say that's one of the, still one of the best ways for learning vocabulary. Right. So that's one thing I would definitely bring in from the traditional approach. Do you find with flashcards, does it make a substantial difference for students if they handwrite it versus using electronic ones or pre-printed ones? You get at least one more exposure if you're yeah. doing the handwriting yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but some would say even in the act of writing, it's deepening your awareness and so on of the the word right. it's not to say that an electronic flashcard is bad or it's worse or you know whatever but you at least get that additional exposure and ad additional sitting with the word when you make your own right what about using the the words um, in terms of in context and things like that with the, the vocabulary is that part of the second language like yes take that yes, yes. absolutely okay. yeah. yeah and that's why i said yeah. don't stop yes. with yes yes <laughs> the yes flash cards. exactly yes. Yeah. yeah move move on and yes learn them in context if you can learn them um, um the the uh, recommended amount of vocabulary you need to know for a text in order to read it and comprehend it, but right. also learn vocabulary from it, is 95 to 98% of the, the vocabulary. In other words, if you have a text and you know 95 to 98% of the words in that text, you can acquire the other 2 to 5%. If you know fewer than that, you're going to struggle and you're less likely to understand it and you're less likely to gain new vocabulary from it. But it is a great way for learning vocabulary if you can get in that sweet spot. Right. So you would uh, you would take like where some classes might take your vocab and you've got a big list that you've got in here. You would be getting that acquisition in place by connecting it, by using those words. If you're introducing a verb, mm -hmm. then we're going to be giving commands in that verb or describing right. what we did with that verb or or seeing pictures of right. <laughs> right. and, and yes. so forth. Right. Yes. And that yes. would be uh, probably a lot more intentional mm -hmm. in those mm -hmm. things. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great.
Very good. Well, this is this is exciting, and um, I have got to get into um, a little bit of uh, instruction, uh, receive a little bit of instruction in these ways at conferences and at uh, some other resources that have been produced. And I found from going from a more grammar translation type of mm -hmm. approach to that, it only just opened up new avenues of understanding and right. read, led to greater reading fluency and yes. things like that. Yes. So I've benefited from from these greatly. I've had some conversations with people at times, though, especially with um, resurgence of interest in, in our age, uh, for example, in classical learning and getting back mm -hmm. to classical techniques. And mm -hmm. I know there are some Hebrew professors that think that a grammar translation method in particular is the classical way to learn. This is the way people learned it in this certain era, so it, that's how we should learn it. What would you say to that? Would you have any push back on, on that kind of idea that that's, that's the way people learn languages? Uh, I would say, well, that goes back as far as like the Middle Ages. But there's an earlier way and probably a more natural way for learning language, and that is just through speaking and listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that, that came a long time before the Latin classicists of the Middle Ages. So. Right. So... So the SLA things are just discovering or rediscovering sort of new, old things. Yes. Right? So. <laughs> yeah, and really honing in on how do, how do we do it naturally best, and let's, let's draw on that. Right. And again, nothing, nothing to prevent, once you get that in place, to go on and to study, you know, the philology and the oh, things absolutely. like that a lot more intensely in the grammar. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as just dropping people off in the deep end of that for the first <laughs> exposure to language. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and I think many drown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a, few, a few folks that really uh, think that way. Right. You know, do right. well. But, right. Yeah. And the people who go on who started that way and didn't drown, they're like, oh, well, of course, that's how I learned it. So that's how everyone should learn it. But. Right. That's something we all have to be careful of. Right. And, uh, not everybody's built like uh, right. the person in the mirror. That's right. Well, uh, when it comes to, I mean, I think you definitely have demonstrated the value with, with your research and your experience, and I uh, enjoyed talking uh, with you today about these things. Are there some things that somebody is uh, watching or listening, and they, they think, man, I, I want to get in on this, but I know there is an explosion of resources now. I'm not mm -hmm. really sure where to start. Are there some starting mm -hmm. points that you would suggest for someone who's maybe picking up um, either the biblical languages or Latin for the first time, mm -hmm. something that you would, would point them to? Yeah, one of my favorite, if you're just starting to learn the language yourself, my go-to would be Olive with Beth and Alpha with Angela. I just think they're great pedagogically, but they're also a lot of fun <laughs> yes. and, and really accessible. They're free, they're YouTube videos that are 10 to 15 minutes long, and you can just start learning, you know, like with your inner child. Yes. <laughs> or, or an actual child. It's a lot more fun if you bring them in. <laughs> yeah, bring, bring your children in if you have children. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So that, I think, is, is a great place to start. But also Glossa House, um, that's their thing. They, they do, so just peruse their website for, for various resources, um, everything from books to um, now a podcast and, and so on that I think are really helpful, a whole variety of things and di from different, you know, if you want to study the Book of Ruth, you've got a picture book for Ruth or, you know, whatever it is. And, and you've got a podcast with them, the SLA that's right. Insights. That's right. Uh, yeah. That's right. And I've shared that on uh, this program before, and I certainly want to point you guys there. That's part of my Monday morning routine is to <laughs> watch Dr. Jennifer Noonan on SLA Insights. <laughs> that's really neat. A lot of great resources that uh, folks can, can jump into, and mm -hmm. uh, certainly uh, second your recommendations on uh, Alpha with Angela and uh, Olive with Beth and uh, mm -hmm. those other things. Guys, look into these. You know, get into these things. Yep. What about uh, up and coming, things that maybe aren't available yet, things on the horizon that you're especially excited for in mm -hmm. these veins? Yeah, um, so first my dissertation will finally be published this year. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you, through Glossa House. Um, also, my husband's work with Zondervan, he's doing Hebrew grammar beyond the basics, the companion for the Greek from Wallace. Okay which uh, it's just going to be a great resource. I get the yes. privilege of reading chapters as they're being <laughs> written, so <laughs> it, it's going to be very good. Um, and then also uh, one resource that's coming out through Hebrew Higher Education, hopefully this coming year, uh, there, at the 
SBL conference this past fall, the National Association of Professors of Hebrew sponsored a session that was exclusively on comprehensible input for Hebrew. And so I had the privilege of presenting the more theoretical background for that. But then the presenters that came after me gave some very practical and engaging examples of how to do this in the classroom. So the one did first semester Hebrew, one did second semester Hebrew, and the other did an example for second year Hebrew. And so that set of, of presentations will be coming out as articles in Hebrew higher education Excellent. coming this year. So okay. we look for that. That's uh, that's online. That's open access. You can yeah. download those for free. So yeah, keep an eye on Hebrew higher education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. And then Glossa House just continues to be putting out these resources like kids book on body vocabulary or, you know, things like that. So keep keep checking the Glossa House website. Right. Now, come now, in. Can we use those in adult instruction classes? Is that OK? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate you uh, coming on the program today, Jen. Uh, as we close, any any final words of an encouragement to to students, to to teachers, just practical tips and you know words of wisdom, anything? Yes. Um, first, to students, the biblical languages are hard. Okay, everybody thinks they're hard. Don't get discouraged. We're looking for ways to make it better, but keep at it and keep going because it is so worth it. It just opens up this world of the Bible that you don't get in an English translation. So persevere, keep at it. And if your your current instructor is not plugging into these things, the, the more communicative stuff, go for it yourself. Go look for these resources. There's so many that are out there that are free, that are available that, to help you out. Um, so do it and, and yeah, persevere. <laughs> it's worth it. Um, and then for teachers, you know, this is a great time to be teaching the ancient languages because there has been this explosion and in interest and in energy for all these resources that are coming out and availability and people to ask questions of and examples to follow and so on. So if you're looking to, to do some of this stuff, I would say try it. Start small, start with what you're comfortable with and next time around add more and just keep working at it. And there, there are, like I said, so many more resources available to you to do that. Excellent. So don't 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 try to do it all at once, right? Right. <laughs> that was one thing I really appreciate appreciated about your book. You know, incremental changes, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Now I do have a friend who would say, "Jump in with both feet." And if you're ready to jump in with both feet, do it. <laughs> but if you're not, it's okay to do it one step at a time. Excellent. Well, I hope uh, you all will do that, and I hope uh, this has been a helpful episode for you. Uh, it's been just extremely valuable, Jen. Thank you again, Dr. Noon, and it's been a privilege to have you on the show today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for asking.